Welcome to Global Dispatches, a podcast for the foreign policy and global development communities and anyone who wants a deeper understanding of what is driving events in the world today. I'm your host, Mark Leon Goldberg, editor of UN Dispatch. Enjoy the show. Later this month, Angela Merkel will step down after having served as Chancellor of Germany since 2005. Her time in office coincided with a number of major world events, including the global financial crisis, the 2015 refugee and migrant crisis, Brexit, Crimea, Trump, COVID, and much more. Throughout it all, Angela Merkel was the de facto leader of the European Union. On the line with me to discuss some of the significant moments in Angela Merkel's 16 years as Chancellor of Germany is Constanze Stolzenmüller. She holds the Fritz Stern Chair on Germany and Transatlantic Relations at the Brookings Institution. We kick off discussing some of Merkel's domestic policy legacies before having a longer conversation about her lasting impact on international affairs. So the German elections are on September 26. At time of recording, the center-left Social Democratic Party had a slight lead over Angela Merkel's Christian Democratic Union with the more left-wing Green Party in third place. That election will, of course, have big international implications as Germany is the economic powerhouse of Europe. Still, I thought this was a good moment to take some time and reflect on Angela Merkel's big imprint on international affairs. So here is my conversation with Constanze Stelzenmüller. Merkel is seen elsewhere as this really cautious incrementalist. But the truth is that her impact on the German landscape has actually been quite radical. Um, Sometimes in, I think, ways that were unintentional, but no less effective nonetheless. Let me tell you what I mean by that. The two big intentional decisions that she made and had had a massive impact were, of course, Um, taking Germany out of nuclear power after the Fukushima nuclear power plant disaster following a tsunami in 2011, um, which has in many ways really, not to put too fine a point upon it, screwed up German energy policy and um, the country's overall trajectory in the direction of uh, non-fossil power sources. It's made it in the short and medium term more dependent on coal and more dependent on gas imports, among other things, from Russia. That's one point. The other point was, of course, famously her decision to not close Germany's borders in the 2015 migration crisis. Um, I, I think like many Germans would say in retrospect, five years later, okay, many of those immigrants were actually integrated successfully into the workforce and into German society. Much more was made of that at the time than in retrospect seems justified. But at the time, because this overwhelmed German local and regional government structure, governance structures in particular, um, Germans got quite upset at what they thought was a, an appearance of dysfunctionality. And this gave the German right-wing party AFD, which until then had sort of been getting no more than 5% of the vote and was mainly a party that was critiquing um, German Eurozone policies, so bailout plans for Greece and others. Um, this gave the AFD an enormous boost of oxygen and uh, made it sort of, just explode on the national scene. And it it entered the German federal legislature with 12.6% in the 2017 election, making it the main opposition party, which was astounding. Um, Those are the two intentional ways in which she changed German political cultures. The the ways where she had, she made decisions that had unintended consequences, I think, were um, one was modernizing the CDU, her Christian Democratic center-right party, which had 
um, languished in opposition under a red in the, for the duration of a uh, center left government. Um, and she felt that it was too heavily male oriented. Um, there was uh, still huge opposition against same sex marriage. And she took a lot of liberal and center left issues. Again, same-sex marriage, um, inclusion of women in the workforce and in politics, uh, minimum wage, issues like that, made them her own, and thereby sort of triangulated the Christian Democratic Party into the middle of the political spectrum and squeezing the social democrats to the wall, who for all of her 16-year tenure had a really hard time, which is why the fact that they're surging now um, you know, holds so much irony for Germany. I think I'll stop there because that was already a very long answer. No, that, that, that's, yeah. that's both very interesting answers and um, you know, details of German domestic politics I was not previously aware. Um, on her foreign policy legacy, I'd like to maybe start by asking you about her legacy in terms of the European project. I think it's probably fair to say that Germany and Merkel in particular was you know, first among equals in the European Union. Uh, what would you say since 2005 were her main contributions to the EU? So it's this, again, is a, is a really complicated topic. Let me start with the most significant thing that I think genuinely saved the European Union in the pandemic. Um, and that is, as chancellor, agreeing to a European recovery package, a stimulus package, um, that I think saved the European co economy from falling apart and thereby sa saved, I think, the European political project from falling apart last year. That was an immense step for her party in particular, which had always resisted uh, European debt issuance. Um, if we want to be completely fair, it was her Social Democrat coalition members again, there's a sort of heavy note of irony here, who were the ones pushing this. Um, her finance minister won Olaf Scholz, who, yes, is the chancellor of the Social Democrats in the upcoming September 26th election. Um, the chancellor candidate, I'm, I'm sorry. And um, they, his finance ministry developed these proposals and it was a... I think a significant decision for the Christian Democrats to acquiesce and to say, yes, we have to do this exceptionally. Otherwise, um, the, the, the price we could pay will just be too high. Okay. So that, that I think was her most significant contribution to the European project. That said, um, Merkel has never in her entire career been um, on the side of the Euro integrationists. Let me explain briefly what I mean by that. There are two big strands in European policy thinking and thinking about the future of Europe. Um, there is the question of, do we need to deepen European integration? In other words, push more decision-making authority to Brussels, centralize it on issues where we are so interdependent that it doesn't really make sense anymore for national capitals to decide these issues. And one of those issues under debate is, for example, banking union. Um, that's a, um, a, a sense that our banks are genuine vulnerabilities in a financial crisis, and we need unified European rules for that. There is another strand of European thinking that says, no, 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 we are probably as integrated as we can, as we are ever going to be able to handle politically, look at the political tensions we already have with Poland and with Hungary and with others. Um, if we, if we um, do any more sort of pushing of responsibility and authority to Brussels, this could all break apart. And instead of which we should continue enlarging the European Union um, and take in, for example, further Balkan countries. And the two opposing poles here have been France's President Macron and Angela Merkel. So France's President Macron has, has consistently throughout his tenure pushed a more authority to go to Brussels, whereas 
Angela Merkel, very much in the tradition of German chancellors, has seen her responsibility in holding together um, European nations and bridging the tensions there are. And, and she has always resisted um, Macron's grand visions for Europe. Um, I am personally, I have to say, while I find the sort of French vision appealing, while I find the critique of the muddling through incrementalist approach appealing, I think that looking at the very real political tensions that there are in Europe, I think that Merkel chose the right path. So to the, you know, to the flaming Eurofederalist, Merkel is not, is not a hero. I actually think she did a great deal to hold Europe together. Mm. That said, there are, there are, I think, two valid criticisms to be made. Even, even if you say that posture is the right posture. One, one is the austerity policies imposed by Germany and by her then finance minister, Wolfgang Schäuble, on um, countries in, in dire needs such as Greece. Um, and the second one, I think, is protecting um, authoritarian political leaders such as Hungary's Viktor Orban because he was from the same party political family, the conservatives in Europe, until it, until he had so ensconced one party rule in Hungary that there was really nothing much mm-hmm. that you could do anymore. And now you have a country that is an EU member state yeah. and whose, whose sort of basic constitutional structure really is at odds with European principles of democracy and rule of law. That leads me directly into my next question, you know, superficially, Mm -hmm. it seems that the European Union is in a lot tougher place today than it was in 2005. I mean, the United Kingdom has exited. And just as you mentioned, there are two members of the EU, Poland and Hungary, who are not even liberal democracies anymore. Mm. Like, to what extent is Merkel responsible for that outcome? Well, I think If you look at the real sort of practical power structures in Europe and the fact that Merkel was the leader of a key country in Europe, if not the country in in Europe, the the, the anchor of political economy in many ways, particularly given Brexit and a France struggling with its own um, protest movements, and, and the fact that she was also the leader of probably the most powerful conservative party in Europe. Um, it seems to me that a great deal of responsibility um, attaches to her uh, inaction on on these issues. Um, The the problem here is that this isn't, you know, this isn't a case where you had binary choices, I don't think. And it's not not a black and white clear-cut issue. An argument, you, you could make an argument a decade ago that this was, you know, different cultural, different cultural values, different, um, different sense of history, a uh, decades of suppressed nationhood under communism, seeking expression, and that Western Europeans who had been able to live in freedom, unlike the Eastern Europeans, were not entitled to impose their values. Um, on on the Eastern Europeans. I mean, I, I understand the reticences of the early years, but I think in recent years, at least for the past five or six years, it has become very, very clear what the Hungarian leader has been doing, which really is turning his country into a one-party state, um, and, and at the same time, um, becoming something of a client state, both of Russia and of China. Those those things really are in opposition to fundamental European values, and and I think that hmm. there, you know, a stronger uh, European uh, opposition led by Germany or with Germany in a key leadership role, I think would have uh, would have really made a difference. Hmm. Particularly since there are both in Hungary and in Poland um, segments of civil society who are very unhappy about this development and who have been calling for European solidarity with their position um, for quite a while. So the only other leader in the region to overlap entirely with Angela Merkel is Vladimir Putin. At the (laughs) end of, you know, 16 years of Merkel's chancellorship, 
How would you categorize the Russian-German relations today? Again, this isn't this isn't black and white. Um, it's complicated. On the one hand, um, it always there is, with is Putin. The, yeah, no kidding. But it also always is with Germany. On the one hand, there is the Nord Stream Two project, mm -hmm. which I think. Um, Germany and just to be clear, that, this yes, is a natural gas pipeline uh, yes. from Russia to Germany or through Germany. Yes, exactly. And mm -hmm. so the, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, I think in many ways, was a sop to Germany's energy industry, given a genuinely darkening business environment with Russia. Um, Germany had hoped after the dissolution of the Soviet Union that the former countries of the Soviet Union would all at some point join the West, not just the Balts and the Poles and the Hungarians and the Slovaks and the Czechs, but at some point Russia, and had seen themselves as the bridge for Russia into Europe. I mean, today you'd say these were delusions of grandeur, but I think that was genuinely what a previous generation of German leaders about 30, 20 years ago thought. It soon became very clear that the post-Boris Yeltsin leadership headed by, by Vladimir Putin had uh, no such intention and that they were going to try and reap as much um, advantage of the relationship with Germany as they possibly could without obviously making any change to the way um, the Russian power uh, is, works and the way Russian civil society is treated. And so I think the, the turning point for Germany and for Merkel personally was the illegal annexation of Crimea in 2014. And honestly, the, 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 war, the Russian war with Georgia in 2008 was already something of a wake-up wake call that got some policymakers very nervous. But 2014 really was the turning point. And I have you know, witnessed, witnessed Russian-German con conversations where I got the impression that the, of just how angry the Germans were and how little the Russians took that seriously or even understood it culturally. Um, and of course, there is still an ongoing proxy war um, between Ukraine and Russia, um, represented by so-called separatists in eastern Ukraine. All of that is of immense concern to Germany as, a, as an issue of, of NATO's security and ultimately also Germany's security. And so I think that, that Merkel, who grew up in the GDR, speaks fluent Russian, and I think you know, has clocked Putin's number a very long time ago, um, I think has always made it very clear what she thinks of this. And in that context, I think Nord Stream 2 was seen as a sop to German, the German industry, energy industry. And where, unfortunately, both Merkel and her senior advisors failed to see just how damaging this was for Germany within the EU and NATO and how undermining of trust between Berlin and its eastern neighbors. Um, I personally don't think that the Nord Stream 2 pipeline gives Russia significant economic, much less political leverage over German decision-making. It really doesn't. Um, and I think that um, there are a lot of ways of making sure that Ukrainian energy supply security and Ukrainian security more generally is, is protected. I, I, I am actually think that in this agreement that the Biden administration made with the uh, with Berlin at the end of the summer, Germany basically took responsibility for the future security of Ukraine. That's a fairly big deal. The other thing that I want to note is that Russian civil society is as restive, unhappy, and dissatisfied as it has been in a generation. And that the Russians are very clearly, and the Russian leadership are clearly very nervous ahead of the parliamentary elections, which are the Duma elections, which are on September 19th, exactly one week before the German national elections. And so there is a tension there um, that I think is, you know, not resolvable easily. And that there are some fairly big um, management issues in the German-Russian relationship for Germany's next chancellor. Um, to be dealt with. This is going to be a big challenge. Um, so we're nearly out of time, but I, I did want to give you the opportunity to 
mention any other foreign policy legacies well, you think will be yeah forever China associated. and the US. We have to talk about that. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, very briefly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Please. So on China, um, in, this is really interesting because here I think uh, Merkel really, out of immense conviction, um, maintained a China policy that attempted to protect. Um, the interdependence between uh, Germany's very export-oriented industry, particularly manufacturing industry, and China for the longest time, and is now seen as something of an outlier, not just in the German strategic community, which has gone, grown more and more critical of Xi Jinping's government, and it's, it's very clearly problematic, um, bullying dominant behavior, not just in its own near abroad, but in, in Europe um, and its interference in European politics. And even in Merkel's own Christian Democratic Party, um, senior foreign policy experts are critical of her sort of very cautious posture and are saying, we, we need much greater clarity in the way we deal with China. Yeah. We mustn't let them think they can bully us. I am old enough to remember when Merkel met the Dalai Lama. <laughs> I mean, it was early in her <laughs> tenure in 2007, but something like that would be unheard of today. Right. Yes, that is, that is very true. And, um, and I think she did that out of conviction. Um, and I, I think that, that she got uh, immense uh, criticism from Beijing after that, and of course, from her own industry leaders. And yes, as you, as you say, she didn't do it again. That said, to be fair, she does also always meet with human rights leaders when she is in Beijing. She's been there 12 times. And I recently saw a graph of her, of her foreign travel in her 16 years in tenure. And I thought that 12 times was a lot, but actually she's been in Brussels and Paris and in Washington much more often than she's been in China and in Russia. The Moscow and Beijing are actually both at the end of the scale. Um, now, just briefly on the, on the German-American relationship, which is, I think, key to both sides, because for Germany, obviously, the, the relationship with America has been special and fraught with all sorts of emotional and political and military baggage, you know, ever since the um, refounding of Germany after World War II. Um, and the, it was really badly damaged during the Trump era, where Merkel, as we now know, sort of decided not to go to G7 meetings because she thought that she aggravated uh, the 45th president so much that her, president, her presence yeah. would be destructive for the conversation. Her facial expressions during those meetings with Trump yes, told an entire said everything. story. Yes, yeah. they did. And um, the the conversations that the Biden administration and the president himself had with European leaders, including Merkel, in June in Europe, I think were very good ones um, and were genuinely good. The mood music was perfect. But I have to say, after the sort of catastrophically chaotic withdrawal of the US and its allies from Afghanistan um, a few weeks ago, I think there is a serious question to be asked, what is left of that and how it can be repaired. So I, and personally, and I, it gives me no joy to say this, I'm genuinely worried, not just about the future of the transatlantic relationship and within it, the, the bilateral German-American relationship, but also about the future of NATO. Well, we'll, we'll leave it there, Constanza. Thank you so much right. for your time. <laughs> You're very welcome. It's been a real pleasure. Nice to talk to you. All right. Thank you all for listening. Thank you to Constanza Stelzimula. That was great. And a reminder, if you are listening to this episode more or less contemporaneously, stay tuned for a great week of programming during the UN General Assembly starting Monday, September 20th. If you're not already a subscriber to the show, please subscribe, follow on Apple Podcasts, iTunes. That way you will not miss a new episode when it is published. Thanks. We'll see you next time. Bye.